Hi everybody. In this unit, we're gonna take a closer look at the concept of excitability or membrane potential. This is all made possible by a lot of the properties of the plasma membrane that we talked about back in our membrane transport unit. Now I should mention at the outset that for most people taking the course for the first time, membrane potential might be one of the more difficult concepts that we cover in this first half of the course. I think there's a number of reasons for this. First of all, people hear that it's a difficult unit from other students, and that makes everybody feel a little bit less confident about the material. Secondly, even though there's not a lot of information in this unit, it is a little bit more conceptual than other units. And so when you're learning it for the first time, you really don't have the framework to plug things into. And lastly, membrane potential is just kind of hard. When I learned about membrane potential for the first time, I literally sat in class and realized that I just didn't understand the words coming out of the instructor's mouth. I mention this because I want to validate that feeling if you have it too, and acknowledge that it's completely normal. Membrane potential is usually something that people have to spend time with, they have to review it several times, and then eventually it'll sink in. But the challenge is to make the time to do that in your schedule. Otherwise, you're just holding yourself to an unreasonable standard and expecting to learn the information without having allocated the time. But to end my soapboxing on a positive note, everyone will be able to do this stuff eventually. And it's actually kind of amazing because once that happens, it's gonna be almost impossible for you to understand why you didn't get hit the first time around. So in this unit, I'm going to talk first about what excitability actually is. And then we'll talk about two different equations, the Nernst equation and the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz or GHK equation that we'll work with this semester. And then we'll wrap things up as always by looking at some examples and that's gonna help to set us up for our next unit, which is neurophysiology. So excitability is the basis of the field of electrophysiology, which has really become the bread and butter of most neuroscience research in the past 30 or so years. The father of electrophysiology is pictured here on this slide. His name is Luigi Galvani and he lived during the 1700s. Now, the 18th century was kind of an interesting time to be a scientist. In a way, it's not so different than today. But there was this raging debate about the mechanism by which the nervous system and muscles functioned. And some of the prevailing theories at the time were that it occurred through divine intervention. Other people believed that some kind of electrical current traveled through the air and was picked up by the nervous system and by muscles. And some people even thought that nerves and muscles could inflate or deflate in order to send signals. Now, Galvani ultimately settled the debate by connecting a lightning rod on the roof of his lab to the sciatic nerve in the leg of a frog that he had dissected out. And when lightning struck the rod, the electrical current passed through the wire into the frog leg, and that caused it to contract. And from that, he concluded that muscle had what he called bioelectricity which was the ability to pass an electrical current. Now, his work had a couple of interesting consequences. The most important is that it launched the field of electrophysiology. But the second is that people realized that you could make dead things move if you electrocuted them. So this led to a bunch of people going to cemeteries and digging up the remains of their loved ones and electrocuting them in an effort to bring them back to life. Now, because one of the major ideas of the Enlightenment was to make information available to the public, these types of experiments would often get written up in newspapers. And so it's actually thought that it may have been Galvani's work that inspired Mary Shelley to write the famous novel Frankenstein, just in time for Halloween. In order to understand excitability, we have to know a little bit about electricity. And specifically, we have to know about how charged particles interact with each other. So as a kid, you might remember the experience of playing with magnets. And if you have that experience, it's actually one of the easiest ways to understand some of the basic properties of electricity. Specifically, that charged particles are either positive or negative, and opposite charges experience attractive forces that bring them together. Like charges experience repulsive forces that push them apart. But if you played with magnets as a kid, then you probably also picked up on two other important concepts that relate to excitability. The first is that attractive forces only work 
over a very small distance. In other words, if you hold those two magnets really far apart, you don't feel any attractive or repulsive forces between them. The second thing you might have noticed is that even though these attractive forces are really strong when you bring the positive and negative ends together, there is really nothing that you can do to keep them separate, right? Your little child hands aren't strong enough to keep the charges separate from each other once those attractive forces actually kick in. So if we want to keep those charges separate, it actually takes a lot of energy investment in order to do that. So inside of our cells, it's actually the plasma membrane that's responsible for keeping those charged particles separate from one another. And that's why we can often refer to this entire excitability unit as the membrane potential unit. Now, we've already talked about how membranes are semi-permeable, about how they don't allow most molecules to move freely across the plasma membrane. And ions are no exception. So that means one of the absolutely critical functions of the plasma membrane is to compartmentalize ions and keep them at different concentrations on either side of the plasma membrane. So the interstitial fluid often has a different ion concentration than the cytosol. But this also means that the plasma membrane can regulate the movements of these ions, these charged particles, and it can do that using integral membrane proteins like ion channels and transporters that we've already talked about. But for now, let's just focus on the fact that the plasma membrane is responsible for keeping charged particles separate from one another. And therefore, all of those attractive forces that are developing create a form of potential energy, sort of like what would happen if you were to stretch out a spring. When the ions are allowed to move across the membrane, as they become permeable, you're able to use that energy to do work. And that's the basis of muscle contraction and nervous communication that Galvani saw. Now, all of the stuff that we're gonna talk about in the course in these units is gonna be based off of that. So if anyone's an aspiring physicist or an electrical engineer, you might describe the plasma membrane as a type of capacitor. The rest of us can think of the plasma membrane essentially as being like a battery. So similar to the batteries that you're seeing on this slide here that we've all used for various reasons, uh, what makes each one unique is the voltage. And it turns out that this is the same thing that makes excitable cells different from each other as well. So in the field of electrophysiology, we're really measuring voltages that develop across the plasma membrane. And we do that with a setup that looks something like this where there's a recording lead that's placed directly into the cell to measure the charge in that environment in the intracellular fluid, right at the inside face of the membrane. And there's a reference lead that's placed into the surrounding interstitial fluid that measures the charge environment there. All this information gets sent to a voltmeter, which calculates the difference in charge between two environments, and that allows it to calculate a voltage. Now, the last part of what I said is actually the most important for us. When we calculate the potential of a cell, what we're seeing is the magnitude of the difference between two compartments. We do this by comparing the outside to the inside or the inside to the outside. But by convention, we always think about things from the cell's perspective. And so when you're given a voltage by me or in the laboratory, it's always going to be describing the inside of the cell relative to the outside. Most of the numbers that you'll see in cells in this course have a negative voltage, and that tells us that the inside of the cell close to the membrane is more negative than the outside. I want to spend the rest of the time today talking about why this voltage exists.